when the Articles of Confederation were signed. Every republic within the Antares system rejoiced in grand ceremonies and idealistic displays of patriotism. Perhaps no deed of the era was more celebrated than the passing of the very first piece of legislation by Parliament. It was a simple act, more symbolic than practical, yet one recorded in history as the first united decree by the Antares Confederacy. What the histories do not record is that this piece of legislation, as celebrated as it might be, was in fact merely the first public measure passed. Many other agreements had already been laid, decisions that would define the future of the nation for centuries to come. Their ramifications were profound, but they were never debated within the halls of parliament, never disclosed to the general public, and never acknowledged to even the few who began to suspect their existence. The first true act of the Antares Confederacy was to maintain the lie, to preserve the silence that existed within every republic and in the assembly that had preceded it. For their own protection, the people could not know the fate of Earth. But when the first reports were received from the Confederacy's distant emissaries, and the presence of the United Terran Protectorates was confirmed, the highest authorities within the government knew that the lie would not last. For now, distance was on their side. For all its power, the galactic community was far removed from the Confederacy, isolated within the frontiers of some distant alien nation. Yet the galaxy was growing smaller, and the truth could not be hidden forever. But the few censored details presented to the Confederacy as to the nature of its first meeting within the community were hardly a footnote. Other events held the nation's captive attention, In the year 285, all Antares looked to the former territories of the Vril Salvation League as debate raged on how to administer their liberated systems and the colony of Torix. There was passionate debate within Parliament advocating that the Vril nation be integrated into the Confederacy directly. But however noble the intentions, few supported any action that might turn the liberation of the Vril into a war of conquest. With a new civil government established, and enormous aid ensured under the Vril Recovery Program, Antares ceded control of the territories it had won in war, and welcomed its new partners in the Vril Republic. With the Vril again a sovereign state, albeit one heavily reliant upon the Confederacy, there was a feeling that Antares had lived up to its ideals. However shocking the outbreak of war might have been, it had ended with a victory built on self-determination and freedom but the Vril themselves would challenge this simple narrative. In the years following the declaration of their republic, hundreds of thousands of Vril would take advantage of lenient immigration treaties to resettle within the Confederacy. These were the Vril who most readily accepted the Confederacy's values, increasingly leaving their republic in the hands of those who did not. Frustrated and driven to anger, protests became common across the Vril Republic, Piracy erupted across its frontier systems, and anti-human sentiment was exploited by ambitious political leaders. Finally, after several humans were killed by violent mobs across Torix, the still pro-Confederate rule legislature voted to dissolve the Republic and incorporate itself into the Confederacy. With the failure of the Vril Republic, the post-war optimism began to fade confronted by an economic downturn and setbacks to the nation's colonial ambitions. Unemployment and resource shortages were commonplace across the extrasolar colonies, and new alien maladies presented themselves without warning. The worst of these ailments would kill thousands on the colony of Samsara, with only a complete lockdown of the planet preventing a catastrophic epidemic. Yet the era was not without its accomplishments. The alliance between the Confederacy and the Cloister of the Spirits was strengthened, growing into a powerful alliance known as the Moya Pact. But no achievement shone brighter than the resettlement of Ariane. The planet, long considered the jewel of the Antares system, had first been colonized by the Earhart Flotilla, only for its settlers to succumb to the effects of the planet's unique magnetic field. Centuries later, 
with the technology to overcome the planet's nature, the sacrifice of those fallen colonists was given meaning, and Ariane was accepted as the first federal territory within the Antares system itself. The erratic fortunes of the Antares Confederacy meant that few outside its various foreign ministries recognized the growing tensions between the Cloister of the Spirits and their immediate rivals in the Althorian Empire. To many, the declaration of war between them in 294 was a complete surprise. Bound by the Articles of the Moya Pact to come to the aid of their allies, the Confederacy was nevertheless hesitant and unsure what form that aid would take. With both Parliament and public opinion heavily divided, the Confederacy pledged to defend the frontiers of the Cloister, but prohibited any offensive action against the Althorians. The compromise satisfied no one. Many were outraged that the Confederacy was taking part in a war in which it had nothing to gain, while others felt that the Cloister of the Spirits had been betrayed through their lack of action. The conflict was sporadic, protracted, and ultimately achieved very little. Yet before an armistice had been signed, a greater conflict would erupt. Emboldened by the Cloister of the Spirit's lack of success against the Althorians, and perhaps spurred onward by the Confederacy's reluctance to aid its ally, the Beldros Empire declared war against the Moya Pact. Again, the Antares Confederacy was shocked by this turn of events, but the hesitation that had stayed its hand was gone. Unlike the Althorians, the Beldros were widely despised across Antares. Warlike and imperialistic, the galactic Beldros Empire had waged a series of conquests against their neighbors, the result of competition between rival warlords within their archaic, feudal civilization. Despite their apparent backwardness, the Beldros had achieved notable successes. Many refugees from territories conquered by the Beldros had fled to the Confederacy and now made up a small, but vocal minority. And for the first time, it was a rural citizen who held the office of the Prime Minister of the Antares Confederacy. The son of an immigrant who had escaped to the Confederacy after the destruction of their homeworld, Dronafeg promised to usher in a new era of bold and decisive leadership. His inauguration was held exactly 100 years after the launch of the CAS Earhart, and he vowed to confront the Beldrus with the same spirit and confidence that those first pioneers had displayed. After the war, it would be learned that the Beldrus' earlier campaigns had left them weakened and divided. The reigning emperor lacked the confidence of his vassals, and only a paltry force of their most radical warlords mustered against the Cloister and the Confederacy. They were utterly crushed in a series of one-sided engagements. The Confederacy's fleets and armies, by contrast, had benefited from a series of reforms introduced after the liberation of Torix, and cut through the meager defenses of the Beldrus feudal lords. With Confederate guns trained on the cities of their home world, the Empire capitulated. At the behest of the Cloister of the Spirits, a new buffer state was established, severing from the Beldros one of their frontier vassals. The war against the Beldrus had ended triumphantly for the Confederacy. Despite the vast scale of the campaign, there was limited bloodshed, and the threat of a costly planetary invasion was enough to end the fighting. The Confederacy's losses were minimal, and a hostile rival had been defanged. Despite this, however, many believed that the recent wars had been needless, driven by the Cloister of the Spirit's strange and often incomprehensible values. The alliance between the two powers, the Moya Pact, had once been the Confederacy's proudest accomplishment, yet now it was increasingly seen as a political liability. By 320 AL, voices in Parliament called for the dissolution of the alliance. Few wished to sever all ties with the Cloister, but there remained the fear that the Confederacy would be dragged into another war. Before any action could be taken, those fears were realized. Among the many nations encountered by the Confederacy had been the Kalar Confederation of Clans. They were in many ways similar to Antares, sharing similar values and ethics. Many times the possibility had been discussed of inviting them to enter the Moya Pact, but these efforts never met with success. Compared even to the other species of the galaxy, the Numa race was completely alien, and the friendship they found with Antares was unusual. 
all too often, the Cloister of the Spirits was unwilling to join with those they deemed unacceptable. In 323, the Kelar clans joined the Althorian Empire and launched a new war on two fronts. Caught between two hostile nations, the Cloister of the Spirits was nearly immediately overrun. Their race was unsuited to warfare, and most of their ships and equipment were merely imitations of those used by Antares. Their tactics were predictable and easily foiled once learned. Any great counterattack would be the burden of the Confederacy alone. But the decades of intermittent wars had left Antares exhausted and economically drained. Recent colonization efforts and improvements to state infrastructure had left the military underfunded, and the scale of the unfolding conflict was beyond anything the Confederate military had yet undertaken. Unable to meet the larger fleets of the Kalar clans in open battle, the Confederation instead attempted a defeat in detail. For years, Kalar and Confederate fleets hunted one another across the vast expanse of their mutual border system, looking for an opportunity to strike. On the Althonian front, the prospect was much less dire. Improvements made to the defenses of the region since the conclusion of the last war made the threat of direct invasion rather remote. The Althonians were themselves occupied almost entirely by the invasion of the Cloister of the Spirits, leaving their border territories nearly undefended. The Confederacy lacked the resources to liberate every occupied system within the Cloister, but the seizure of an Althonian colony was enough to force them to redirect resources from their invasion. The Confederacy struck deeper and deeper in Althonian territory, giving the Cloister the crucial time needed to mobilize a more effective defense. As the war dragged into a stalemate, exhaustion grew on both sides. Secret negotiations laid the groundwork for peace, but with the majority of the Cloister of the Spirit star system still occupied, the Althonian Empire and Kalar clans insisted on terms the Moya Pact could not afford. Without a decisive victory by either side, the stalemate would continue. In 335, 12 years after the outbreak of war, the opportunity finally arrived. On the borders of the Kalar clans, a large fleet of vessels moved to seize the outermost frontier systems of the Confederacy that had changed hands multiple times across the conflict. The Kalar hoped to force Antares to accept their terms, but they had played directly into the designs of the Confederate Navy. The Battle of Corolla was the largest naval engagement in the Confederacy's history up to that point. For the first time, Confederate cruisers, the largest warships the nation had ever put into service, traded fire with alien warships of similar size and capability. It was the decisive victory the diplomats had been waiting for, and with Kalar warships burning all across the frontier, the two sides finally arrived at an armistice. The peace treaty was signed by Prime Minister Dronafeg, elected to a historic second term to again lead his nation in a time of war. He appeared before Parliament to announce the end of hostilities, surrounded by his staff and senators, humans and other rule, but also many other species from across the wider galaxy. There had been a sense within the Confederacy that their first century among the stars had been one of missed opportunities and senseless conflicts, but footage of the peace ceremonies underscored something that had been largely understated. The Antares system had been a refuge for the first pioneers of the Earhart Flotilla. Now, it had become something more. Humanity was left there by circumstance. Others arrived by choice. The citizens of the Confederacy were not only human, but Vrul, Newman, Tavarite, Anaran, Kalar, Ruggan, Athonian, and many more. They were immigrants, refugees, idealists, and dreamers, who saw in Antares the exact same thing the pioneers had seen, a chance to work and build a better life for themselves and their descendants. Something was growing within the nation, something it had lacked for much of its history, a sense of purpose, a sense of pride, a sense of belonging, and the persistent belief that the nation's best days was still ahead of it.
In Stellaris Invicta, the Templin Institute guides the Antares Confederacy into an uncertain future, one you can influence. Every Saturday, we'll livestream our progress on our Twitch channel, and our viewers and patrons will have the opportunity to vote on decisions and shape the history of the galaxy. If you missed the live stream, you can catch up on what happened when the stream is published the next day to the Templin Archives channel. Then, once a month, we'll produce a video like this one, detailing everything that's progressed in the Confederacy's struggle to return to Earth. The next live stream of Stellaris Invicta Season 2 begins one hour after this video has gone live. And while you're waiting, we've added some new posters and t-shirts and other merchandise to the Templin Commissary. You'll find the link in the description.